rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to Summit Avenue online and at home. I'm Susie Beal, pastor at Summit Avenue, and I'm actually not at home today. I am at the church upstairs in one of our kids' rooms, bringing our welcome and our message today. I'm also wearing my red in celebration of Pentecost today, the day we remember when God's Holy Spirit descended upon a group of friends sheltering in place. And we rejoice that God's Holy Spirit continues to seek us out wherever we are to ignite our hearts with love, with belonging, and with a message of hope to share with the whole world. And so we light our fire, our candles today as we begin our worship service. So if it's safe to do so in your home, I invite you to light your candle as we center our worship and our lives and our prayers around Christ Jesus. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hello, Summit Avenue. It's me, uh, Cameron Ross, uh, here to read some announcements for this week's uh, church service. Uh, I am in East Bremerton right now, and things have been going all right over here, but I am taking online college classes and those are not fun at all, and I'm looking forward to them being over in a couple of weeks so I can have some more free time. Uh, today we have two important announcements. First of all, after worship this morning, you won't want to miss a Zoom coffee hour. First, we'll welcome three new members to the church. Then there will be a congregational meeting for the purpose of electing an elder and a deacon to fill some vacant positions. Both new officers will also be installed during coffee hour, so be sure to log into Zoom after the service. Uh, secondly, Kitsap Rescue Mission has been working hard to feed, house, and care for homeless families and individuals at the Kitsap County Fairgrounds these last couple of months. They are doing some really important work and could use some help. They are in need of indiv individually packaged food items like snacks, juice boxes, uh, sugars, and creamers, and also new still-in-the-package underwear from both men and women and in all sizes. You can bring donations to the church and place in the box outside of the office. Staff will be checking the box regularly, and we'll be sure to get everything delivered to Kitsap Rescue Mission safely. Uh, thank you for your faithful support of their mission. Director of Community Development at Summit Ave Church, and I would like to lead us in a time of prayer on this Pentecost Sunday. I'm used to praying to God, our Father, our Creator, or to Jesus, our Redeemer, our Friend, but I don't always know how to pray to the Spirit. 
maybe this is you too. But as I was reflecting this week, I was thinking about the twofold work of the Spirit, to comfort and to disturb. As I watch the news this week, I think, yeah, we need, we need both. We need to be comforted and disturbed. So this morning, as we enter into a time of prayer, may you take a moment to breathe. Breathe in the breath of the Spirit. And may you and I be courageous enough to ask for comfort and for discomfort. And as we pray, I want to share an image with you by Rebecca Brogan, an abstract image called the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I wonder how this image of the Spirit and the Spirit's work might help you enter more deeply into prayer. So let us pray. Holy Spirit, Jesus spoke of you as a comforter, a helper. And so today we pray for your comfort. Comfort the mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, friends, and acquaintances of those who have died and those who are dying from this destructive pandemic. Comfort the exhausted parents, healthcare workers, pastors, therapists, teachers, social workers, food workers, and all those whose work supports our communities. Comfort those who lie in bed each night with worry for tomorrow, for the mentally ill, depressed, and lonely, for the unemployed, for the small business owner barely hanging on, for those who sleep outside without safety of shelter, and for those who are one paycheck away from losing everything. Comfort those who mourn the deaths of our black brothers and sisters at the hands of those tasked with protection. Comfort us. But Holy Spirit, we know too that when you arrived on Pentecost, you arrived in wind and fire. And so we also ask that you burn away that which is destructive and with your mighty power move us towards a just world. Disturb our systems of oppression and the parts we play in them. Disturb our comfortable lives. Disturb us so that we cannot look away. Disturb us so that we might see more clearly. Disturb us at easy answers, at hurtful jokes, at microaggressions. May we be humble to receive correction. May we be bold to challenge wrong perspectives. Disturb us to action so that we might work together for the full humanity of all your children. Disturb us. Holy Spirit, stay near. Call us into a way of new life. Through the gift of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and more. Hi, this is Francis from Illahi. May the peace of Christ be with you. Hi, this is Barbara down in Rue Villa, sitting on Francis's deck, 10 feet apart from her. The peace of Christ be with you all. The peace of Christ be with you. Good morning, this is Steve. This is Sandy. Coming to you from East Bremerton, the Illahi area. <laughs> Today's Bible reading is from Acts chapter two, verses one through four and 16 through 18. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. The word of the Lord. I want to begin today with this prayer from Psalm 143, verse 10. Teach us to do your will, for you are our God. May your good spirit lead us on level ground. So this last week, we were sitting around our table one, the dinner table one night, talking about an important decision that we need to make as a family for our summer plans. And we had narrowed it down and had started putting things on the calendar and, and talking logistics. And then our youngest asked a question and made an observation none of the rest of us had even thought about. And that changed the course of the conversation and we realized we needed to rethink all our plans. Now, my husband and I could have made the decision on our own because we are the parents, but we invited the boys input because we are planning uh, something that very much affects them and they need to be involved in. So the big idea for today's sermon and also what we as parents of teenagers have come to learn is this. Wisdom is found in listening to the younger generation. So today is the seventh week in our eight week sermon series on the book of Job. We will wrap it all up next Sunday. Today we meet a new friend, a young man named Elihu. Uh, so as a quick recap, the first two chapters of the book of Job tell the story, which I believe is best understood as a parable, the story of a man named Job who experiences a series of terrible losses and unspeakable suffering. And then the next 29 chapters are back and forth between Job and three of his friends about why this has happened to him. And it's an examination of the question of why there is suffering in the world, why bad things happen even to very good people. So Job's three friends defend the traditional wisdom that says blessings come to people who live obedient lives. Pain and suffering, on the other hand, come to people who sin. And Job, he defends himself maintains that he has not sinned. Chapter 25 is the last time we hear from one of the friends. It's Bildad, the Shuhite. And then for six chapters, we get Job's last poetic defense of himself. His final lament against a God who he says does not play fair and seems very far away. And then chapter 31 ends with this. The words of Job are ended. And then chapter 32 begins here. So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzzite, so let's stop there. Elihu, El always means God. Elihu means in Hebrew, he is my God. And Barakel, so son of Barakel, El blesses. God blesses. So of the family of Ram, Elihu of the family of Ram became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. Now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he. But when he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. So three times in four verses, we read that Elihu is angry. I 
think it's interesting to pause here and consider something many of us probably rarely take the time to be curious about. And that is this. What is it like for people younger than us to listen to us talk as if we know all the things? So I am 51 years old and I know that the teenagers and the 20 somethings consider me an old lady and I have got the gray hairs to um, fit that. Whereas I've got people in their in the over 70 crowd who call me kiddo. I care for neither title, but it's an interesting vantage point. If I'm honest, I know there are plenty of times that I haven't made room for people than, younger than me to give input or share in the conversation. And yet I know I get a little boil of anger in me when I am called kid or I feel like the only voice given weight in the room is that of the people older than me. So Elihu has been listening to his elders as they defend tradition and he's angry. So what I notice is that young people might well harbor some strong feelings about what we older people consider wisdom and we older ones might want to get curious about that. So continuing on in chapter 32 in verse six. So Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzzite said, I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak, advanced years, advanced years should teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. Huh. It is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. It is not only the old who are wise, Elihu says, not only the aged who understand what is right, Therefore I say, listen to me, I too will tell you what I know. And this is where I have to make a confession. I was actually going to skip over Elihu in this sermon series. I said at last Tuesday's staff meeting, yeah, I think we can just not worry about Elihu and his six chapters in the book of Job. Let's just get on to chapter 38 when God finally speaks. And then the next morning, I actually read those six chapters and I felt the Spirit say, no, let's stop here first. And so here is what stopped me. Three things I wanna share with you that stopped me. First of all, by including these six chapters from Elihu, that's a lot of chapters, six chapters of Elihu that are uninterrupted by the three older friends or Job himself, by including these six chapters, the book of Job, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, and indeed the canon of the whole Bible, I think by including it, the message from scripture is clear, that wisdom is not wisdom without the voice and the contribution of the younger generation. We have to listen. We have to invite younger voices to the table especially those of us who consider ourselves older and wiser. I think this time of isolation and quarantine, oh boy, it's been humbling for all of us, um, especially as we consider how much we are dependent upon the wisdom and the tech know-how of the younger generation. Can I get an amen? Uh, it's the 20 and 30-somethings that are writing code and developing apps like Zoom and FaceTime and keeping us up to speed on Facebook. Those are the people keeping us connected. It's the teenagers and sometimes even the toddlers who are figuring out the smartphones for us. And it's the young people who are giving up graduations and camps and tournaments to stay home and protect their parents 
and their grandparents right now. Wisdom is to give value and voice to every generation. So I realized it would not be wise to sweep Elihu to the side and skip over him. The second thing that stopped me is that Elihu, remember, his name means he is my God. Elihu is the first and the only one in the book of Job to speak of God's spirit. Hmm. As this is Pentecost, Holy Spirit Sunday, I realized, yeah, we better make room for Elihu. The spirit is upon him and he's got something to say. 32 verse eight, again, it is the spirit in a person the breath of the Almighty that gives them understanding. Not age, not gender, not color of skin or country of origin. It is the Spirit of God in a person that gives them understanding. And then verse 18 of chapter 32. For I am full of words and the Spirit within me compels me. Oh, yeah. Then skipping ahead to the next chapter, chapter 33, verse 4, he says, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. We celebrate Pentecost as the day a rushing wind of God's Spirit ignited a room full of followers with language and understanding to share the story of resurrection and forgiveness in Jesus. But it is not the first day God's spirit ever showed up. No, here in this most ancient of stories, Elihu says, the spirit of God is upon me and I have something to say. Which brings us to the third thing that stopped me in my tracks this week. Because what Elihu says is this, you friends defend tradition and Job, you defend yourself but I am here to defend God. 34 verse 10, Elihu says this, So listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do evil, from the Almighty to do wrong. And then verse 12, he says, It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. Verse after verse, Elihu continues to defend God's character, first as just and right, and then he moves into God's mystery and might as creator of heaven and earth. So I just want to read a snippet to you, but I encourage you to read all of this. So chapter 36, verse 26, says this, How great is God! How great is God beyond our understanding. The number of God's years is past finding out. God draws up the drops of water, which distill as rain to the streams. The clouds pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on humankind. Who can understand how God spreads out the clouds, how he thunders from his pavilion? And then Elihu's six chapter long speech comes to a close with these words at the end of 37 in verse 23. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. In God's justice and great righteousness, God does not oppress. Therefore, people revere him. And then listen to this line. God does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. It's like this mic drop moment for Elihu. I'm glad I did not skip over him. Wisdom is not wisdom without the contribution of the younger generation because it is often the young ones who point us best to God. Consider the whole arc of scripture. It was Abel, the younger brother, whose sacrifice God favored. It was through Jacob, not Esau, who God chose to birth a nation. 
when Jesse paraded his first seven sons before Samuel, it was the youngest, David, who was anointed and became Israel's greatest king. And it was to a young girl that the Holy Spirit came to ask if she would carry and give birth to salvation. And it was in the tiny person of a baby boy, born in a humble stable, that God chose to become human and show humanity God's deepest wisdom and love. It was a 12-year-old boy who sat in the temple, wowing the elders with his wisdom. It was a 20-something carpenter who unrolled a scroll in the synagogue and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. And it was a young 30-something who died on the cross. Foolishness to the wise of the earth and yet God's greatest wisdom and love. Wisdom is not wisdom without the contribution of the younger generation. We have said as a church that we feel called to cross the river into a new future, to hold tradition a little more loosely and listen to those on the other side of the river, to listen to the younger generations as well as people of different cultures and perspectives. May we be wise and give them voice a place at our table. May these rooms be filled with the voices of children and young people. For it is often the young ones on whom the Spirit of God falls with power. The ones we might skip over who best point us to God. To the glory of God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Holy Spirit Sustainer. Amen.
We say it every week, and every week it holds new meaning and renewed purpose that you go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Remember, wherever we go, God is sending us. So go with the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit Sustainer, this day and forevermore. Amen.